Welcome to another episode of Wiki Weekdays with myself, Cal Smallwood, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Lucas Holland. Hello! And uh, yeah, I went like first last week, didn't I, with just the uh, the absolute out of left field pick. You did indeed. That, speaking of just the internet and just people like you know responding before they fully like. So, was there ever more proof that we needed that people will <laughs> comment on things before watching episodes than everyone? Like, oh, I love Warhammer. I think it was like the first or second comment or something of like. Someone be, oh my god, yes, Warhammer, I love this so much. And I was like, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I'm so it's sorry. Really, it's really funny though, because uh, my, our friend who we talked about who like um, uh, is in it was our, like laughing so much. <laughs> like, he just sent me a message of, like, I can't believe you did it, you absolute madman. I'm like, yeah, that's right. And thank you to everyone who commented, because everyone pretty much like, you know, in the comments was friendly about it and took it in good spirits. So thank you. Mm-hmm. That's how you can tell they're like, um, uh, not a Warhammer fan proper, because what they should have done is flip the table. <laughs> Actually, no, that's Magic the Gathering and Yu-Gi-Oh fans, isn't it? I, I don't, don't imagine people I don't flip. even know. It's like, are you allowed to like flip a table in a TCG room, or is it just like the dense fog of sweat just too thick? The that's tables a... won't move. Oh my! Can you imagine flipping a table full of like Warhammer figurines, and they all that's like hit your opponent in the face? <laughs> it's like yeah, that's a tactic. Just next level tactic, but uh, yeah. So, so Lucas, you'll be going first on this episode of Wiki Weekends, mm-hmm. Weekend, Weekdays, I should say, because it's the podcast, isn't it? The Wiki Weekdays unfamil- podcast. If anyone unfamiliar with the format, it's uh, myself and Lucas will scour the length and breadth of the internet to find a wiki page that we'll just discuss. And as always, we invite you, our lovely audience, um, watching on YouTube or listening at home on podcast services, to vote for which wiki won this week. Let us know about the comments, our social media, what have you, and just. Without further ado, Lucas, what wiki have you brought this week? Well, Carl, uh, there's no twists or turns going on in in my wiki page this week, but you know what there is, Carl? What is there? There's lots of spins. There's lots of spinning. So this is either going to be something Sonic-based <laughs> or Crash Bandicoot-based? It is neither. It is neither? Okay. It is neither. This wiki page we are covering is about Blendo. Who's Are you Blendo? familiar with the robot Blendo? Wait a minute. Is this like from like BattleBots? This is from Robot Wars. Is this robot Wars. It's it's from when BattleBots in America was originally called Robot Wars. Okay, so I'm a huge fan of Robot Wars, but which I mean, I watched it when I was twelve, mm-hmm. yeah. and I'm just gonna like tell me the name again. Blendo. Blendo. I'm just gonna look at it, and before I'm Blendo. And it's called Robot Wars, yeah? Yes. From Robot Wars. Let me just have a look at a picture of it. <laughs> okay, that's the strongest robot ever. Yeah, so uh, we'll cover Blendo in a second. We're but, just talking um, about Robot Wars. Well, it's more that I want to talk about the person that made Blendo. Okay, so that's the thing. Like, so let's describe Robot Wars to people who maybe aren't familiar. It's just a show where people build a robot. There's a yeah. couple of rules like you generally have to stick to, like you can't. Like, put a gun on it, for example. Uh, um, it yeah, they have, like, certain weight limits. And, There's a weight um, limit, a horsepower limit. You can make yeah, the engine only so powerful. You can only use certain types of weaponry. Like, I know, for example, uh, like, infamously, like, at one point... Because normally they're, like, no um, entrapment things, like, nets are allowed. Which you've and told then, me about before, yeah. Yeah, one year they, like, forgot to put that in the rules, so someone abused it. And then they were, well, that's, it's against sportsmanship. It's like, you took it out the rules. And I got super mad and super salty when you told me about that a guy who, like, read the rules, mm-hmm. figured out there's a change in the rules, and then used it as a loophole and built, like, a robot's fired a net. And it's like, well, that's not fair. So what is yes. within the rules? <laughs> Why did you take it out of the rules, then? Uh, yeah, and, but... Um, yeah, it's basically just for the most part, you you know, you have two, three, four robots in an arena. They do count on its last man standing in like three minutes. Yeah, and generally, like early seasons of both Robot Wars and BattleBots, there was a lot of like variation, but it very quickly became apparent that the absolute strongest possible robot was one that was just a circle. With a saw on it and just span around really, really fast, which I imagine is that what Blendo did? I mean Blendo Blendo is truly the unstoppable robot. Yeah, because over in the UK we had Spin Doctor, didn't we? Which was just, it was like a, a big spinning circle on mm. just like what was looked like uh, like a, a dolly that you'd have in a shop. And it, it was unstoppable. Locked, yeah. Nothing could touch it. Nothing could hit it. 
It was the most unbeatable thing ever. And you had all these cool robots like, this costs 45 grand. It's got like, you know, <laughs> space age technology. Like, but what's he going to do when it's just being hit at 1,000 RPM? I still like the person that uh, built like a hamburger robot in one of the later BattleBot seasons and was mm-hmm. like, look, I know I'm not here to be taken very seriously. I built a hamburger robot, but I just wanted to bring a hamburger robot. And that's one of my favorite things about the show because you would have... There was like, I'd say three archetypes and you'd have parent and child who liked the show and just built mm-hmm. it in their back garden with like a lawnmower engine. And it usually yeah. had a really stupid, inefficient weapon. Mm-hmm. You had an amateur enthusiast who was just like an absolute, who pro- they're the ones who built the best robots because they just like absolutely tinkered the hell out of their design. And then you mm-hmm. had the arseholes who just try to like, well, I'm, I'm the smartest and they've got the most money and will spend tens of thousands of dollars building the perfect robot. And yeah. it was always so satisfying seeing those guys get their ass kicked. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, as I say, we'll, we'll cover what Blendo actually was in a minute, but yeah, I came across this because like, uh, you know, maybe like a, a few weeks back, mm-hmm. um, Mr. Adam Savage of Mythbusters fame put out a video talking about his experience with Blendo. Because is, is the, this the, the one that was built by the Mythbusters guys? The the the, the guy Jamie Heineman, the man himself, was yeah, the one who built Blendo. Because, is, wait a minute, is this the one that was so good that to ban it? <laughs> yeah. Because I remember like there's a story about the Mythbusters guys that like, before they got famous, one of them built a robot for Robot Wars that just annihilated everything, and they had to stop it because like it's unbeatable. Is this that robot? It, this is that robot. Oh, yeah. oh come on, tell me about <laughs> Blendo then. So, Blendo is a com- uh, is a combat robot designed and built by Jamie Heineman, again, of okay. Mythbusters fame. Mm-hmm. Um, Adam Savage wired the electronics and the control system, so he was, like, an intern for Jamie at the time when they did this. And the thing um, as well is that I'm looking at it, and it looks unbeatable, because it's yeah. just a circle with a saw on it, <laughs> and there's no moving parts. Yeah. and um, it, it, it looks like, Joe, when... Uh, like, uh, you ask, like, AI to design the ultimate weapon. <laughs> yeah. And humans always think it's, like, you know, covered in bells and whistles. It's like, well, no, every additional thing that moves is a weak point that can be exploited or fail. Yeah. The ultimate killing machine will be a ball with a gun on it. it and that's it, what this is. It's just a ball just, with a knife. It's so good. And, um, yeah, I'll, I'll link the um, Adam Savage video in, like, the description below as well. Because, like, mm-hmm. he just talks about how cool Blendo was for, like, 10 minutes. And I'm like, yeah. Go, go give that a watch after this. Mm-hmm. But uh, Blendo had the first effective implementation of the full-body kinetic energy spinner weapon that became common in BattleBots. Again, yeah, well, this was Robot Wars, but got changed to BattleBots in America. Yeah, the two uh, strongest things were either the flipper or the um, uh, the spinner. And now Nothing else of, was like really competing with either of them. Yeah, like a lot of them... Um, like this one are like full body spinners, but then you've mm-hmm. got other ones where they use like horizontal or vertical spinners. But any either way, like some kind of spinner weapon has normally proven to be like the ultimate tactic. Yeah, I think the only one that really ever broke out of the mold was do you remember Razor in the UK Very Robot roughly. Wars? And it was like based on a scorpion. It had like a scorpion's tail, and its whole thing yeah. was it'd spin down, but it'd trap them in, and then just this giant razor tail would go all the way through the robot. Mm-hmm. And that was almost unbeatable because every other robot that had like the crushing thing on top, usually like a pickaxe or something. Yeah. And it'd swing yeah. it once and it would do a bit of damage but not much. But Razor just crushed. Yeah. And just crushed. And it was unstoppable. And I think it won like three in a row. <laughs> it's the only one I can think of that wasn't a spinner or a flipper. I mean, yeah. The, the, there are quite a lot of like fun, unique ones when you watch battle bots, but that's the sad thing is when it gets to like the top eight, it's nearly always like, oh, here's like eight spinners. And you're like, because okay. it's the people, yeah. It's the people who figured out what is the optimum way to destroy an enemy robot. And usually it's just, you want as few moving parts as possible because every moving part is something that could go wrong. Mm-hmm. And it's so funny because, like, that's essentially why this was so unstoppable because it had basically zero ground clearance and no way to attack it anywhere. Well, that's what I mean. Looking at it, it's just a circle. It's just what it is. Is a, a robot had a shell made from a wok and was spun by a lawnmower engine, and it's like, right, job's done. Yeah, well, that's the thing, though. That's what I mean. That's the the I remember the three archetypes, didn't I? In like you know, parents and child, amateur enthusiasts who take it way too seriously, who win, and then people try and like buy their way into the top. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what we're describing here. 
just two weirdos who are really into engineering. Yeah, and it's just, yeah, um, blades attached to the shell cause damage to opponents, removing bodywork, and in some instances cause them to be thrown over the polycarbonate safety shield into the audience. Yeah, that was the reason it was like banned, wasn't it? Because it was like the audience was at risk of being hit by a piece of other <laughs> robot Blendo destroyed. And it's probably the in- entire reason why when you watch modern battle bots, it's like an entire fucking like hell in the cell for these robots. Yeah. There's n- there's no way to get past like any of the safety precautions because I presume they saw what happened on Robot Wars with Blendo and went, yeah. oh no. Like this could go wrong. It's like um, I was watching one of the more recent um, seasons that we've got over in the UK, at least on mm-hmm. Netflix. And the I can't remember which robot it was, but it just it sent a piece like an entire shard of metal into the safety shield, mm-hmm. and it like lodged inches into the safety shield. It's like, well, they just get more powerful every year. But the thing yeah. I'm looking at though, I'm having a quick look at like um, uh, battle bots. Mm-hmm. Do they not have the house robots? No, no. Battlebots so, is strictly just you've one got, on one. Um, like hammers in the corners where like the teams can activate them to do a little bit of extra damage, and they've got like floor spikes, and they've got um, like floor saws that come up with a minute left, and they've got like um, little like rotating spikes on the um, outside to like pull enemies enemies pull robots out yeah so this is like um, a rare situation then where the British version of a piece of media is more intense than the American one because normally like the American one normally has like bigger spectacle and scale doesn't it because America mm. everything's bigger the British one we have house robots and those house robots are not um, uh, bound by the rules of the competition that everyone else has to adhere to mm-hmm. for example the most famous house robot what's his name Lucas um, I'm guessing you're going to go with Sir Killalot. Sir Killalot, yes, who is like f- f- over £800, so £500 more on the limit, and has the <laughs> jaws of life from like a fire department on his arm. Yeah. And my favourite bit about the house robots is, you know the people who made them are fucking nerds. Oh. Because every now and again, you'd have one person who'd go in and attack the house robots, just for fun. <laughs> because why would you not? I remember there was one episode where some guy went up and attacked Sir Killalot first turn. Because oh, he's like, well, why not? I want to flip a house robot. And normally the house robots aren't allowed to leave their designated area. And the risk is if you go in, they'll get you. The second round, that's it. All four house robots come out to get it. Because <laughs> you know behind the scenes, the people who made them were salty that their version, their robot, that is like, breaks all the rules, got his ass kicked by this <laughs> one made by someone in their shed. Oh, that's great. I love that. America- like, the house robots are just like, no, we must defeat this person. <laughs> Because it means you know the person controlling it behind the scenes was salty that their robot got flipped over. And I guess that maybe that's um, the difference between like the American and British style is like for us it was more of like a spectacular TV show, whereas I mm-hmm. think in America it is a TV show, of course, but I think it's way more like competitive and taken yeah, like, way more seriously. I think you get like a trophy and a couple grand for ours. What America, I mm-hmm. guess they have a big prize pool, what have you. They, you, you get the nut, Carl. <laughs> you win a giant nut. Okay, I can I can get behind this. Let's go. Tell me more about Blendo. So Blendo competed in the second Robot Wars competition in San Francisco, 1995. After two fights against robots uh, Namreco and Dumor, mm-hmm. uh, it was deemed too hazardous to compete by the event supervisors and the insurance company after throwing pieces of its opponent over the arena walls. The thing is that that must mean then it's impossible. Like you win by default. My well, robot's I, too good. It was given co-champion status in exchange for withdrawing from the competition. Yeah, it's so good. It's like, it would not be fair for this thing to compete. It's like, it's too dangerous to compete, but also at the same time, you clearly built the best, most unstoppable robot. Yeah, so we can't tell you you've lost. And you can't be love, disqualified because yeah. you played by the rules. So like I said, like, the, you can't stop spinning. Spinning is the most <laughs> ultimate of all of the um, uh, robots. You should get yourself one big sturdy walk and make it spin real fast, Carl. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, then two years later in 1997, it returned in the fourth Robot Wars. After the height of the arena walls had been increased to prevent debris from reaching the audience. Mm-hmm. In this competition, Blendo again fought two robots, Hercules and Punjar, and quickly defeated both. And 
After causing damage to the arena walls in both matches, Blendo was once again asked to withdraw in exchange for co-champion status. At that point, just like stop letting them compete. They're clearly going to win. Well, that's the thing is two years later, they must have been like, right, we've we've doubled down on our safety precautions. You're allowed to come back. Mm -hmm. And then it was still just too dangerous and demolished everything again. It's it's incredible. Oh, my God. um, so I, Luke's, I, I've, I've just Googled, like, see, try to find that robot I was on about from Robot Wars. Oh, yeah. And he's like, oh, here's just an article on, like, all the full-bodied spinners that have taken like, part in Robot Wars. And just here's just one of the things that happened. Of just, oh, hopefully God, this, no. does this GIF work? That's not a GIF, is it? Is that not working? <laughs> you just sent me, like, a screenshot of a GIF. That's okay, really so I, I need to get this GIF working because this is incredible. <laughs> so what it is is, it's like a GIF of, like, potential problems with using such a powerful robot. Mm. <laughs> and just, it spins so fast. Oh, God damn it. Can it's you click not, on it and watch it? I wonder if I can, like, visit Can you click website? it and watch it? Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> just- it's just a spinning blade. That's going so fast that it just flips itself it out of It completely turns itself upside down because it's too fast. And um, that's, it reminds me of like, oh, um, oh, like that, you know, video that I was talking about from Adam Savage where he says like, to start with, Jamie wanted the thing to spin at like 40,000 RPM or something. And we couldn't do this. It, and we, we could not make it heavy enough. That it basically it ended up at like a, a hundred RPM or something like that, but like something you, you just wanted like the most insane, like spin it the fastest possible. It's like you can't do that, it will just kill people. But it's like when you go look at um, uh, like the Japanese version where it's just like the, instead of wheels, it has chainsaws, and it's like, why is this loud? <laughs> and um, yeah, one one thing that I found interesting was that talking about how they like um, activated the robot instead of mm-hmm. having like a rip cord to activate the lawnmower. Like a Beyblade, yeah. Uh, like a Beyblade. Instead of doing that to activate the engine, he he'd, like, devised a drill system mm-hmm. where he had to stand over the robot and drill it into it. That and terrifying. It to start the spinning, and he Would was you... apparently the only one willing to do it. What's well, because your ankles are right next to that. <laughs> yeah. Your like ankles are like they would full like risk. stand on boxes, and only Jeremy would turn it on because everyone else was like just terrified of this thing. W- wouldn't you be? Because I was just I like, because I think as well, I found the one that I'm on about that was just like fucking unstoppable the first season it was in. It's Hypno Disc. Hypno Disc, yes. Yeah, I remember and all Hypno-Disc. it was is just a. Gi- it's basically a buzz saw on a. A dolly, yeah, and it w- nothing could beat. I remember it was, it was one of the first like spinners in the British version of Robot Wars. I'm pretty sure what, it was like champion multiple times through. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what had happened is people would just they try and crash into it to knock it over and they'd just fly off the arena. Mm-hmm. It was insane. And there's like a picture of it with like fighting Sir Kill a lot and Sir Kill a lot scared. <laughs> so you, uh, the picture is like Sir Kill a lot, like um, he's tense to try to approach it with his like jaws of life. Oh my god. Yeah, and that's that's just why I, I love Robot Wars because like both versions of Robot Wars BattleBots. Either way, I just I love watching stuff like that where you just find like ridiculous robots that just ultimate destruction machines. There's just something about the idea of like it's like it's the simplicity. Mm-hmm. Of, like I said, it probably was going against these devices like that people worked on for years. It's like we've got a fucking walk with a saw on it. Yeah, because they just worked like okay, what is the most the strongest possible shape we can do? Okay, a circle, obviously. And it is funny because you you do think to yourself, like, when watching Mythbusters, it's like, why did this guy, why do these guys, you know, ne- never go on something like Robot Wars? It's, oh, it turns out they did and they were too good. Yeah. They just got stopped because they were too efficient. Um, okay, so it said Blendo uh, would later compete in BattleBots as well. Mm-hmm. Um, however, despite its cap- capacity for extreme violence... Blendo had little success in BattleBots. Okay. Um, it said, a combination of a stronger arena design capable of containing the energy of Blendo in brackets. Was <laughs> That's released. That so powerful that to redesign it. <laughs> uh, stronger robots were able to take multiple hits from Blendo, 
similar spinner designs were added, and Boleto's own tendency to tear itself apart yeah. caused it to be defeated in its first match in all four bottom no, it, events. No, what that means is it, the only opponent that could defeat Blendo was Blendo. <laughs> I like to choose that he's wanted a warrior's death. <laughs> Do you know that thing of like no uh, nothing no robot on earth can challenge me and he just like just it self immolated in the ring and it's like just transcended and that that screams to me that um so clearly that you know they made stronger um arenas mm-hmm. and clearly stronger like you know allowances were then given so like people could make more violent robots clearly yeah. And what it sounds like to me is that they then amped up Blendo and just like got closer to that forty thousand RPM that he wanted. Terrifying. And he just started tearing itself apart. I've also as well, while I was like looking at some Robot Wars stuff, I found one of my favourite robots. So I know we talk like we Joe interesting of like the idea of like something so simple is usually what's gonna win. Do you mm-hmm. remember Robot the Bruce? No no. So Robot the Bruce, not Robert the Bruce, like, you know, um uh, like famous um, historical figure in the UK. Hmm. It was a... I'm just going to send you a picture of it, Lucas, and you just describe Robot the Bruce to the folks at home. I was just taking a sip, sorry. Yeah. Oh, just what? Des- describe it. What is this fucking, like, PC tower on wheels? What is? What do you see? So I, I see, a, you know, um, essentially, like, a big steel and hardened plastic box with yeah, wheels yeah. on it. What weapons do you see? I don't. Yeah, that's the thing. He didn't have any. Do you know it was? just it, take hits until it was just a, the enemy tore itself apart. It was a box on wheels, and all it did is push other opponents into a hole. <laughs> Jokes they have like the danger zone with a big hole. That's all it did, and it won its first season by just crashing into other robots and pushing them into the hole. That was his only. It's like we're just going to build something completely indestructible. Like basically, it's an indestructible box, and it just pushes everything else over. And it worked, and it won its first season. That's great because there there are some times where, um, yeah, there's been like you know big upsets and battle bots when I've watched a few seasons. Like for yeah. example, there's there's one which um, you know has won a couple I think now mm-hmm. called Tombstone, and that's like the one to be. Yeah, and it's just a, a giant chunk of metal that spins super fast on the front of a box. Yeah, and. There's been multiple times where it's basically defeated itself because it's hit something that can take the hit and then and just, just like fallen apart because all the force has got redirected back at itself. Like they put a mirror force inside the machine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, it turns out sometimes you know defense is the best offense. It's the thing like like the absolute most just defense, just the unit. And I just love that. So they said, fuck it, make a box. And it just apparently nothing could touch it because it just drive into all the opponents and just push them into the... So that thing is, it just looks like it's like the, like, you know, bulletproof glass kind of plastic. Yeah. And then a bunch of, like, fucking steel rod enforcement. And it's like... Yeah, defeat do, me. Do you put Modern Warfare and you pick the riot shield and you just push all your opponents <laughs> and that's it. And it's like, well, you, you've got no offensive options, but you also can't be hurt. I think so, one of my favourite things was learning that when you had the right shield on your back, it still worked as a shield. Yeah. I will I, I never forget when I was watching one of my mates play we were just playing some Modern Warfare 2 with him. People don't know like Modern Warfare, the riot shield was just this big piece of plastic. But it was immune it's a riot to riot shield. Yeah, yeah. but it, for some reason it was just immune to all damage from yes. anything. Except for a sticky grenade. And that was the only thing that you could do to kill someone holding one with a direct hit. Mm. And um, just my mate was watching him play and uh, someone called in a Predator drone missile. And my friend said, don't worry, Carl, I've got this. And I'll never forget it when he walked out into the middle of grass outside the bikes. We were inside like a building. He went outside and just looked directly up. So his character <laughs> model just bent all the way back. And I just saw the missile hit him. The smoke cleared. He's just there spinning on the spot. I'm like, yeah, boy. <laughs> so what his like character did is he just looked directly at a missile and just like blocked it with his shield. Just tanked it. Yeah. Like a fucking centurion, just like, Whoa! oh dear. I know. Who's the best? There's not much left to say about Blendo. Uh, it's as here, you know, um, the creators of the robot went on to host Discovery Channel series Mythbusters. Never heard of it. Uh, it also featured fellow com- combat robot competitor Grant Imahara and his robot Deadblow. So that's where they all met uh, each other. Just all well, met each other at Robot Wars. Carry like um, on like Robot yeah. Wars. We don't know about it. I think like a bunch of it was just that they they either met each other or um, 
you know, got connections through ILM and stuff like that. Because mm-hmm. like, uh, I, I can't remember if all of them were there as interns or not, but like they basically all just had internships at these like amazing different places. And just like, I think, yeah. and just yeah, I mean, like I, I, you know, I, I bloody love MythBusters. I think it's like one of the most entertaining TV shows, just in terms of like it's entertaining, but also gives like that insight to. So, like, clever solutions for problems and yeah. just a bunch of, like, d- interesting science questions and stuff. I will, though, give props to um, uh, that guy on Reddit who edits down Mythbuster episodes to be 25 minutes long by just removing all the parts where they repeat themselves because it's yes. American and they have adverts every 10 seconds. That is the downside, yeah. Yeah, like, it's a 45-minute long show, but, like, 25 minutes of it is fluff as they repeat what the um, uh, the mystery they're trying to solve is. Because they're trying the guy to stretch on Reddit. it out for TV, yeah. yeah. So there's a guy on Reddit who just compiles them all down to 20 minutes long. I think they're on <laughs> YouTube as well. Fair. And, and I was just looking up something, which is hilarious. Uh, do you remember Razor? I talked about Razor. You did talk about Razor. I want to, like, Google Razor Robot Wars just to, like, remind myself what it looks like. Yeah, it's, I, I think it won... Like it was crowd favorite for a long time because of how fucking cool it looks. It looked like mm-hmm. a scorpion, but it apparently it had a rivalry with a another robot called Tornado, and Tornado was a robot that was like a little box with um, uh, a spinning blade on the front. And what it did is when they had like a one on one for like an all stars match, Tornado <laughs> rocked up looking like this. Oh my god. <laughs> So it just it, it just, just has designed like, itself with like a, a fuck you you can't reach me. Yeah. Like, so then they covered it in scaffolding. So Razor would <laughs> destroy by like so this big scorpion tail would come down and crush. Mm-hmm. So they just built like scaffolding all around the edge of it so Razor <laughs> couldn't get it. It just outranged it. <laughs> yeah. I I love stuff like that. I think there was another one that did that in Battlebots recently of like. He just saw one weakness in its opponent and like built extra things on the front so it couldn't reach it. Do you know what the best bit is though? Like Razor tried pushing it into the pit, the hole, but the box made it so big it couldn't fall in. <laughs> so it had to be a draw, and it's like, yes. The last thing is they just decided, yeah, clearly Razor's gonna defeat us. At least we can just modify ourselves and get like at least a draw out of this. Yeah, just build the anti razor tech. Because Razor yeah. beat everything. Yeah, it said there that it was like a double champion winning robot. Yeah, it won almost, like nothing could kill it. And it was made by like the same kind of weirdo we're talking about where like every season is like, okay, here's like the new anti thing on mm-hmm. the back of it. And it it is funny though, because it is similar to other things where certain robots become so good that like people make like <laughs> anti meta picks. Or they'll like, you know, try and copy its design. Because so I remember it was like mm-hmm. Hypno Disc was like the one sat the spinning revolution in Robot Wars, then Razor was the one that. Let's see what you did there. They never really had any pretenders to Razor because it was so unique. That's why it's one of the most recognizable. I was always surprised it never became a house robot. Mm. I was always wondering like why they never like upgrade like made it into house robot status and let them just build a version that was like against the rules and just absolutely max it the fuck out. I, I've searched for the wrong thing. I should have. Uh... I want to send you this robot, Carl. I okay, don't know if one. you'll uh, you remember it or not, but it's in um, it's in BattleBots, but it's like British guys that also were on Robot Wars. Okay. Um. So copy image. I'll send that over to you in Discord. But it's basically it's a robot called Warhead, and it's just like it's this massive chonker of a robot. Okay, I don't remember that. That looks. And Similar they, to Razor, a little bit. A little bit. And sometimes they have like a spinning top on it, and other times mm-hmm. they put a giant, like, f- flame spewing T Rex head on there. Why would you not? They replace the spinning thing. But when it's got the spinning top on the front, they have the ability, if it gets flipped, oh, is to it do one- an upside down attack. Yeah, is it. Like, uh, <laughs> wasn't there also that robot that had smaller robots inside? There's, there's many ones with like and small mini robots, robots would come yeah. out. And it's like, yeah, they just immediately get killed. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I'll ever forget. Like, there was that, I don't know which robot it was, but it's like one of the, the flipper robots. That was like the most powerful flipper they'd ever seen. Mm. And someone managed to flip that one, and everyone's like, well, it's game over now, isn't it? And then it activated <laughs> its own flipper and did a full front flip and landed by. It's like, oh! <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, that, that's Blendo for you, Carl. Blendo is an inaugural member of the Combat Robot Hall of Fame, and it, of course it should be. Here's the question, though. How you like? Do you think you could take out any of these robots with just a baseball bat? No, no way, no, no way in hell. These are combat no. robots. Yeah, what would what it take for you to go in and try and fight Blendo? <laughs> just it's just the ankle annihilator. Might as well be like a razor scooter on the end of it. Like, and just you know, want to shout out everyone? Go watch that spaced episode where it's the Robot Wars episode. Just go watch spaced. Just go watch spaced. It's great. Yeah. You if know, you like um, like Hot Fuzz and Shaun of the Dead, go watch spaced. It's basically it's, just the precursor it's, to it. It's the precursor to the Shaun of the Dead, and it's where they got the idea for Shaun of the Dead. Yeah, the Resident Evil Two episode, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah. just like. It's it's very very like you know late nineties early noughties as it was made in that time, but it's, it's in such a such a good show. I and like, if you like, love yeah. the editing and comedy style of like Edgar Wright, Simon Pegg, Nick Frost, like it's all there. Yeah, because I remember once where I said like, oh, you can't get it anywhere, and someone got really mad. Went, oh, it's on DVD. I went, yeah, it's not available. You can obviously buy a DVD, <laughs> but they don't. Re- it's not available to buy as a new thing. If you're always getting mad when you say that, it's like, well, I bought it on DVD. It's like, yeah, you bought a pre-owned copy. They're not still minting DVDs. Eventually, they will run out. Yeah, they, it's not something still being distributed. Yeah, your ability to get it relies on the fact that someone has one that they don't want anymore. Mm-hmm. And not the fact that, you know, you can just buy one from a store because they're currently like, you know, still in distribution. Or like, it's like a Channel 4 TV show. What are the odds that, like, they're going to have DVDs over in, like, America? Yeah. But, uh, you know, find a way to watch it, I guess. It, it might be on some streaming service, I don't know. Yeah, if you can track it down. I think it's on all four or whatever. But, but either yeah. way, yeah, go watch Space and Robot Wars. So I always thought it was Craig Charles. Oh, uh, like, the, the thing is, you know... But who's it hosted like, by in America? It, uh, I can't but, remember the names. But it's them. no like, one interesting. One of the, uh, no one of the hosts is an, an ex-MMA fighter for BattleBots. I don't recognise any of the people in this. Um, no, I, I never... I recognise quite a few of the guest judges they've had on, mm-hmm. um, but I don't normally recognise like the hosts or anything. Yeah, because we had Craig Charles do ours, didn't we? We did, but Craig Charles has been tainted for me ever since I went back and watched Takeshi's Castle again. Oh, and how racist it is. I went, oh, no. And like yeah. some of the stuff that Craig Charles is spouting, I was like, oh, this is just... Yes. It's not even like on the edge. It's like just extremely offensive. Yeah, because it came from that era where it's like, oh, Japanese equals weird. People don't know like Takeshi's Castle. We had it hosted by a guy called Craig Charles over here, and I'd, I'd like to think from Red was, Dwarf fame, yeah, that he was just reading the scripts that he was wrote. I'd like to think he didn't write it himself. I, I'd hope so, but again, that them were the times, Carl. Unfortunately, is like yeah. that kind of just nomenclature was very common and scarily so considering this thing was like in our lifetime Mm -hmm. and yeah it's just it's tainted Craig Charles for me so like every time I just see him I'm like oh no the Takeshi's castle is coming back to me yeah so oh let's just you know add another head to that um, uh, fact fiend image I created once like the pantheon of Asian racism in media so we're just going to yeah. add like Takeshi's Castle, the British version, alongside the cats from uh, Apparently Aristocats. they're bringing it back, and I'm hoping that, you know, it can be brought back in a way that just like, is just, here's a funny TV show and doesn't have to bring like... There are only two hosts, Alex. All that shit into it. Yeah, it's either Dick and Dom have got to host it, or <laughs> Harry Hill. They're the only, th- like... No, Dick and Dom, have you not seen? He's like a house improvement TikToker. No. Why like, either Dick or Dom. <laughs> And he ju- he's just like, I'm, fuck it, I'm I'm doing up my house, I'm going to TikTok it and show you how to improve your house. I was like, I, I didn't realise that this was where I was going to find either Dick or Dom, I can't remember. Oh, man. But, it's like, cool. just two guys who's on the most amount of, like, cocaine, just screaming <laughs> at kids about white, like, you know, about wonky donkeys. But it is Pete, great. Pete when just, it's, it's great when I realise, oh, they grew up and are now teaching me how to be an adult and not a child. It's, like, great. Do you remember that era of, like, 90s TV show, though? Where, like, just they didn't give a fuck. And they would just, like, annihilate people. Like, they would, like, you know, oh, remember Gunge? Like, where, oh, what happened to Gunge, Lucas? Gunge? Do you remember Gunge, where people would get Gunge for TV shows? Like, you, you know, you like, drop... Like, they drop the, green the slime. Goo. 
Yeah, they the dropped like, green yeah. slime on people. And did you ever see what happened to Kate? Like the person who got it the hardest was Katy Perry. Yeah, at, like the Nickelodeon Kids Awards. Have you ever I seen like just the that. picture of her getting gunged? And oh, what was that nineties kids TV show where you would bring somebody in to get like dunked by the slime? I think it was. Uh, it was Get Your Own Back, was get it? Your own, yeah, Get Your Own Back. It's like a I, British like 90s entire, TV show. The entire premise was like, oh, a kid that's like eight years old was like, well, my teacher was mean to me one time. And they would bring this teacher into the show to get strapped to a chair. And like the more and more the kid did well in tasks, the that closer would... they got to being slimed. And it's like, what which is that fair, show? Which, to be fair, though, is based on a pretty old British tradition of like throwing wet sponges at your teacher's. Mm. So like Americans might not know this, or might not have experienced. Maybe they, if it is a thing you do in your schools, let us know. But there's like a, a very strong British tradition of like the school fair, where like a teacher or the head teacher usually will like you know get dunked into a book, like you know the bucket of water, or like you could throw a wet sponge at them. I was going to say more commonly it would be that they would get put in like the um, dunk tank. Remember. No, no, I'm thinking they get put in, like, the stocks. Yeah, the stocks. You can throw, like, wet sponges. And on, like, you just throw wet stuff. sponges from, like, a certain distance at the, at the stocks yep. and hope to get get some, like, oh, a, a bit of water on them. It's yeah, like, and it's just, like, a little bit of fun. So I guess it's just the, the that taken to its logical extreme. Because <laughs> I never forget, the royal family took part, no, took part in that um, uh, variety show where, like, they got shaped, like, they all wore, like, giant inflatable outfits and stuff. Do you not remember that? Not at all. Like, were they took what, what game? Let's have a look. So, the Royal Family game show, it was the Grand Knockout Tournament. What? And it had the Princess Royal, and they were competing for charity. And they took okay. part in it, and they dressed up, and they, like, played the games, and they, like, did, like, um, uh, yeah. Grand Knockout like, Tournament. I just clicked on the Discord to see if you'd sent a picture. I just saw Katy Perry just getting absolutely she just got an, She got annihilated, didn't she? Yeah, but I see they took part. Like, Prince Charles and stuff took part. Oh, dear. Not Prince Charles, Carl. Oh, King Charles now, yeah. So there's, like, footage of our king just, like, you know, running around getting, like, chased by a when, guy. With... When, are, when are we all just going to decide, like, down with the monarchy, Carl? When are we going to do it? When are we going to get the French Revolution? I don't know. Do you like, it's English like, you edition. Just, so, did you ever see that one where, like, Princess Diana was, like, taking one of the kids to school and they had a school sports day? And they went, oh, it was, um, uh, uh, it's tradition for the parents to take part. And went, well, a royal wouldn't take part. And Prince, oh, and she was just like, fuck you. Yeah, and, and she, she just did won. it anyway. She, she, went, she was so rapid. Like, she absolutely crushed it. Well, it was great. you know, there's a reason that everyone loved Diana. There is, yeah. But just like she absolutely crushed it and all the other mums are like, what? It's like after that, it was all downhill from there. It was, but like, yeah. Down with the bourgeoisie, Carl. Down with the bourgeoisie. Do you know what? I'd be, I'd be all right with like, you know, the royal <laughs> the royalty if they took part in Takeshi's Castle once a year. <laughs> just once a year. Make them do Takeshi's Castle or total wipeout. No, make them fight a Robot Wars robot. No, Ninja Warrior. <laughs> i tell you what, if you, could do, if you could do Ninja Warrior, you deserve to be king. Oh dear. But yeah, I guess uh, we can, on that note, take a quick break before I go on a, a, a very. <laughs> down <laughs> with the Royals. <laughs> so, what's a very Luke's different a... side of the podcast would that be? Luke's least favourite class, the bourgeoisie. But yeah. Well, uh, we'll be back in a moment. And Carl, we are back. We are indeed, yes. And I, I guess, like, just. During our nice little housekeeping segment that we always have mm -hmm. in the middle, um, is there anything that you would like to promote? Um, just, you know, the usual, my Twitch stream, my my five channels that I now run and host, like Fact Fiends, Top Tens, Biographics, Geographics, and Wiki Weekends, of course. And, like, just to clarify, you run, like, Fact Fiend and Wiki Weekends, but, yeah. like, you're just hosting over on those other ones before... What's the th that's the thing People I found take out. out the wrong way. Yeah, the thing I didn't realize is that, like, Simon Whistler, like, you know, really prolific dude online, and I wrote for him for many years. People mm -hmm. think he writes all of that stuff. And I was really baffled by that. I was like, what? How can someone possibly think that he writes, like, for 40 different channels? I know he writes for the stuff, his own personal stuff, the same way I do. Mm -hmm. How could they not just think he's the host? But 
I guess, I guess because of the way that like YouTube works is normally people just assume yeah, they whoever see like, is on camera is the person who runs the channel because like that's how YouTube started out. But now it's you know there's so many in like channels that are just entire fucking networks of people and stuff that like yeah similar with top tens like I'm surprised they've got like, you know a, a writers and then they have an editor and they like then they have their video editor then they have their producer then they have like they've got like eight different people who touch these videos five and get it five and do the hosting and sometimes you know that's not even necessarily like a a big team like not a lot of the time it's thirty people you know what I mean like. Yeah. So, well, you know, when you're like Mr. Beast and you're just buying an entire fucking like slave town mm-hmm. for your producers, and everyone's like, wow, this is really great. It's like, no, he's just built. For, like, the, we had these in like the 1900s when they build towns for one business and everyone who worked for the business worked there. Like, what time are we going to get where they're only allowed to eat Mr. Beast burgers and pay with Beast bucks? <laughs> That's the thing, isn't it? Imagine your entire life and your entire neighborhood is your job and is your work. There's a name for it now. You it's, can't um, escape it. There's a there's a specific word for it. That I'm just gonna look up now because it's gonna annoy me if I don't know what it is. A company town. That's it. Mm-hmm. Where it's like they would own like you know everything. It's like what point are we gonna get to when he's just built one of those? But everyone's like, wow, it's a, like it's a wacky thing a YouTuber's doing. It's like, nah, man. We got like these things were horrifying <laughs> back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> And, like, a lot of it did stem from, um, you know, companies wanting to treat their employees correctly and making sure that, like, you know, they all had affordable housing and stuff like that. But, yeah, it also... It was rife for abuse, awful yeah. undertone, yeah. Yeah, it was rife for, like, the, the thing that people would do is they pay with scripts. It's like, oh, you're not paid with money, you're paid with money that can always spend at the company store. Mm-hmm. Money which we control the value of. And they were just like, every time people tried to... And it's like, I'm not saying that Mr. Beast doing that, I'm just saying it's very strange that he's being celebrated for doing something that is eerily similar to the shit that resulted in, like, a workers' revolution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ah, but either way, speaking of uh, a workers' revolution, are you ready to talk about Space Jam and New Legacy? Oh no! Yes. I was so down, and then, uh, and then the the New Legacy came. You in. were so down for those first two words, but those last three words just snatched away what little hope you had. I didn't do it? love myself some jam in space, but I have not seen the second film. Oh, where's it? I've got like the VHS somewhere. Like, people who've watched Fact Fiend probably know the Space Jam VHS. The, the bright about. green case in it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like, before we even get into the wiki, fuck this movie. For no other reason than it ruined the original, like, 1999 Space Jam 1996. website. 1996. 96. That website was a legacy of the internet. It was, yeah, because like you always have the thing that like, trend every couple of months, wouldn't it? Like the original Space Jam 1996 website is still up, <coughs> and then they had to replace it for the new one. But for people who maybe aren't familiar with Space Jam, a new legacy, Space Jam, a new legacy, sometimes and also known online as Space Jam 2, is a 2021 American live action slash animated sports comedy film produced by the Warner Animation Group, Proximity Media, and the Spring Hill Company, distributed by Warner Bros. Pictures. And it always freaks me out. I like Warner Bros can distribute his own film. So that's how you get like Hollywood green. accounting. Like, you know, we're speaking about like really weird business practices that are like shady and underhanded. Are you familiar mm-hmm. with the idea of companies distributing their own films? I just assumed that was a pretty normal thing. Well, it is a pretty normal thing, but it's also really rife for abuse because Warner Bros, mm-hmm. when they distribute a movie that they made, can pay themselves or charge themselves whatever they damn well feel like, which is how you get like overinflated uh-huh. marketing budgets of like, oh, this movie cost us $300 million to market. It's like, oh, who markets it? All oh, the marketing arm of Warner Bros. So you mm. paid yourself $300 million and then wrote right. that off as a loss. And then the other company writes it off as a loss, whereas Warner Bros. writes it off as a profit. And it's like, yeah. But anyway, oh. uh, the, f- the film was directed by Malcolm D. Lee with a screenplay by Joel Taylor, Tony Rattenmeister, Keenan Kugler, Terrence Nance, Jesse Gordon, and Celeste Ballard with a story by... Taylor, Rattenmeyer, Kugler, and Nance. So five writers. So three writers, five script writers. Do you know what that says to me? Quality. Nothing says, says quality like five writers. It says to me, creative vision, Carl. It does, doesn't it? It says cohesive creative vision <laughs> with one person like at the helm. 
It serves as a standalone sequel to the 1996 original and is the first theatrical release film to feature the Looney Tunes character since Looney Tunes Back in Action, which only looks better with the gift of hindsight. Because that movie was pretty poorly received, even though it's, yeah. I'd say it's... And it's kind of sad to look at now, knowing it's like the end of Brendan Fraser's like success as an actor. It's like the oh, last what? big film he was in. Besides, like, I think the third Mummy movie... And it was kind of like the trend of his like his downturn from like he was in the Mummy, wasn't he? Huge big film. Yeah. And he just he never really got his big break because well, he I mean, like we, he literally did now. He has now, yeah. And that's it. It's taken like twenty years to get him back, which kind of mm. yeah. Like Looney Tunes back in action was like, oh, you're going to be with the Looney Tunes. Space Jam was huge, and like Brendan mm. Fraser, Bugs Bunny, what could go mm. like you know what could fail, and then it did. And you're like, oh. Yeah, and it's weirdly one of those things where like obviously the first Space Jam movie was also like this awful cash grab that was based off like a 30 second TV advert it, yeah it was, people don't know the Space Jam it's based on an ad where Bugs Bunny played um, basketball with Michael Jordan and it said let's make that into a movie and it was like an Air Jordans ad or something like that yeah and it, it, yeah again it was a cynical corporate movie but somehow it was like the one that made out on the other side. Yeah. Um, against all odds, it was like a likable movie, even though obviously, you know, there's plenty of things wrong with it, like Michael Jordan cannot act for the, to save his life. Yeah. But, you it, know. It, it, and not to mention as well, the bit where Michael Jordan, because it's one of those things you don't notice as a kid if you rewatch it as like an older, cynical adult, where like Michael Jordan's like, oh, go to my house, and he lives in like a brownstone on like a cul de sac. It's like, Michael Jordan doesn't live in a house like that. He lives it's in. Like, Yes, that was a very, very nice, very, very big suburban house. But, like, he That's doesn't have neighbours that close. <laughs> no one lives near Michael Jordan. <laughs> no. Legendary asshole Michael Jordan. Such an asshole, he grew a Hitler stash and no one commented on it. Hang on, oh. wait, when did that happen? Do you never see, like, when Michael Jordan just grew, like, a Hitler stash? I do not remember this story. Do you remember when he just did that and, like, everyone was like, why has he got a Hitler stash? But then it's Michael Jordan, so everyone was scared to, like, say anything. Oh, and there's always still another, like, you know, there's fuck you money and there's fuck you, I'm growing up like a Hitler stash. That, that's not something that many people get past. Yeah. He, he grew the Charlie Chaplin car. Yeah, that's it. He just grew one for absolutely no reason other than, like, fuck you, I what can. What the fuck? Yeah. And he, he didn't even grow it well. No. That's the worst part. Yeah, he just, like, his soul patch, he sneezed and his soul patch fell on it, like, went up. <laughs> Either way, so the film stars. Do you remember any of the people who starred in the movie? Uh, it's LeBron James and LeBron James's son, right? Yeah. And uh, Don Cheadle himself. Don't forget Don Cheadle. Is, is he credited in this one or not? Uh, yeah, he is. Don Cheadle wanted his paycheck. Um, he, uh, wow. he didn't pull an Ocean's Eleven and decide that he was too good for the movie. No, he was, he was too good for Ocean's Eleven, but no, Space Jam A New Legacy is <laughs> all right with that. And then we've got uh, Jeff Bergham, um, Eric Bowser, and Zendaya as the Looney Tunes voice cast. Oh, I didn't realise Zendaya was one of the voice cast members. Uh, we'll find out when we get to the casting, I suppose. Uh, discussions mm. for a Space Jam successor began following its release. Uh, original director Joe um, uh, Peitke was attached to return in some capacity, as were some like the original animation directors. However, the project was stalled due to Michael Jordan's refusal to return. And there's the arsehole. There's the real Michael Jordan coming in. It is, and that's one of those things, isn't it? Like, the Space Jam 2 rumours was going for so long. Well, that's the thing that you mentioned here, that um, uh, possible spin-offs focusing on other athletes, including Jeff Jordan, um, American stock car racer, Tiger Woods, the golfer, and here's the one that's the most gutting, Tony Hawk. Oh no! Why so they, didn't oh? So they were the going to make and the bunny. Yeah, that's what he was going to. They were going to make a Tony Hawk, a skateboarding one with Tony Hawk. Still after the success of um, uh, like the Tony Hawk series, and they brought like skateboarding to the zeitgeist. And guess what it was going to be called? I, I I can't think of anything other than the Hawk and the Bunny at this point. Skate Jam. Oh, of course. That would be so perfect. <laughs> My yeah. uh, God, like, why are we living in the, the bad universe where this we is, never yeah. got that movie? And it says that um, after several years in development hell, a LeBron James-led sequel was officially announced in 2014. So it took seven years to come to fruition. Ooh. It took them seven years to make this piece of shit and it, was still, it still sucked. Yeah, but it's got the guy from Clockwork Orange in the background, Carl. Don't yeah, you love like, that? I love, like, having fictional rapists in the back of my kids' movie with Bugs Bunny. 
why. But I guess we'll get to that in a moment. Anyway, yeah. so it says that uh, premiering <laughs> on July 12th, 2021, uh, <laughs> it was it was on HBO Max four days later. That's but when you know that, they... Is that due to, like, COVID stuff, though? Probably, yeah. It was considered a box <clears throat> office disappointment, grossing $163 million against a production budget of $150 million. But you've got to keep in mind, there's also a marketing budget on top of that, and marketing budgets generally aren't disclosed. So it was probably a box office bomb, if not a disappointment. Yeah, they normally, like, with a lot of bigger movies, uh, again, COVID, it's messed up a lot of the, that stuff, but... Mm-hmm. Generally speaking, it's like double your budget when you yeah. include the marketing. Like rule of thumb is yeah, you double your like. What if your your budget for your film is a hundred million? Marketing's probably the same, mm-hmm. unless you're the Barbie movie. Then it's like we're going to spend three hundred million marketing it. I mean, it it, worked. it paid off. Yeah, it's <laughs> a gamble that paid off. But so it's here that um, it received generally negative reviews um, for its script, humor, runtime, and particularly extensive use of product placement and Warner Media properties. It won three of its four Golden Raspberry Award nominations, including Worst Actor for LeBron James. And I think what really, like, probably just the difference between the first one and the second is. Is like, yeah, they're both not great movies. They're both starring, like, you know, p- basketball players that can't act. But it's mm. like, it seemed way more that, you know, the supporting cast was the focus in Space Jam 1, whereas Space Jam 2, as far as I can tell, has it's... less of that. It doesn't have, like, Bill Murray and Wayne Knight. It doesn't, ha- like, focus mostly on the, sp- the Looney Tunes when it gets to the Looney Tunes segment. Yeah, so as someone who watched it, it is... The like the first one is not a great film, but despite Michael Jordan being a legendary piece of shit, he didn't make it all about himself. It's not a Michael mm-hmm. Jordan vehicle. He's there, but like you barely notice him for half the film because you know you have entire sections sitting like Toon World, don't you? And then you have like all the yeah. bits with Danny DeVito and mm-hmm. the Monstars, which are incredible yeah, course, yeah. because Danny DeVito is like a treasure. And then you um, have like you know just brief snippets to like his family, like you, know, you see his kids yes. very briefly and his wife, but they know that's not interesting. The, the the second one, it, not only is it two hours long, so already like 30 minutes longer than you'd want it to be. Yeah. There's almost no other appearances from other basketball players. Oh, you know, like, really? The first one, they have, yeah. like, the entire, like, you have like Muggsy Bogues and Charles Barkley and stuff like that. Yeah, because they steal their abilities. And, like Patrick Ewing, and they the have premise, that like yeah. neat section. Those really neat, like really fun vignettes of them like in the hospital without their basketball playing ability. Yeah. They don't have any of that. It's just all set in the cartoon world. As LeBron James going, huh? The entire and, like, film. Let's bear in mind as well, like, again, Michael Jordan may be an asshole, but he was fine with, like, letting them take the piss out of him in that movie. But, like, you know, they literally, one of the first things they do is, like, look into his head and go, like, oh, there's, it just, they look entirely through and they're like, yeah, there's nothing in there. He's literally yeah, they, an airhead. And they, like, you know, they make fun of him. And, like I said, there's other basketball players in that. And they, like, mm-hmm. you know, they're happy to have themselves, like, made fun of, like, you know, I think they have. I forget the name of the the basketball. But it's the shorter one of the monsters. Yes. Like where they're yeah. talking about the fact, the like, you know, yeah, what are they gonna do? And he's like, well, at least you guys are tall. <laughs> it's just like little moments like that, isn't it? Like when they're and in hospital, that like one walks into like the all of them except the short one walk into like the the mind your head sign. Yes. Just yeah. Little and character moments like that that are memorable. Yeah, that's the thing. Is it mostly doesn't focus on Michael Jordan, and as you say, there's like seemingly a lack of ego in that movie despite the uh, huge amount of ego on the man yes yeah and i'm sure there were elements of it during production and stuff but it doesn't oh, yeah, it come across very much in that film like famously like michael jordan's like i want an entire basketball court built for me to play with on my own <laughs> when i'm on set but like you similarly though he had uh, into his contract throughout his playing career had a clause called the love of the game clause that was made just for him and other sports stars have since gotten and uh, like since it became known and mm. essentially like, when he played for the Bulls they were like well we can't play for anyone but us because you might get injured because like, what about if I want to play a pickup game like, if I go mm. down the street and I see someone playing a pickup game why can't I go play with them what about if I want to like, you know, do practice with my friends on the other teams mm-hmm. I should be able to do that like, no she might get injured so he had him right into his contract that he can play whenever he wants because you know he enjoys the game like it just reminds me I have the stories of like Usain Bolt kept getting caught playing football and like stop it. Yeah, you might you're fall gonna over. get yourself injured. You might snap your leg. It's like when he crashed his car, didn't it? 
Like, he got, mm. like, the first thing he did when he won, like, a gold medal was buy a really fast car and crashed it five minutes later. But, yeah. um, you know, we have the cast. Anyway, the live-action cast, LeBron James, Don Cheadle, a bunch of actors who needed a paycheck. Just think, he's not even got any, like, I guess. Okay, Sarah Silverman and Stephen Ewan play Warner Bros. executives. And there's, like, right. three cameos from, like, actual basketball players. Because that's the thing. But again, yeah, you compare that to, like, people actually giving quite a decent amount of screen time, bear in mind, of, like, Wayne Knight, Bill Murray, and Danny DeVito. Yeah, that's I mean. There's, like, there's no one here who's, like, that side character to, like, go against LeBron James because they realize Michael Jordan, he's not a very charismatic guy. Like, he has a lot mm-hmm. of charisma as, like, an athlete and a personality, but he's not a great actor. He can't carry a scene. Bugs yeah, Bunny can carry yeah, a scene. He's not an actor, yeah. yeah. Wayne Knight can carry a scene. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, like Bill Murray can carry a scene, and they just seemingly didn't have that for LeBron James. And yeah. as well, just I'm going to mention it here because it's not mentioned in the wiki page, is that LeBron James, according to a rumour that we don't know for sure, but you can probably guess is accurate by looking at pictures of LeBron James in real life and the movie, had a specific thing written into the contract of the film where they used a not insignificant part of the CGI budget to fix his hairline. Because yeah. if you look at the poster for the film, like his hairline looks real, real clean. Real pushed forward. Yeah, he's got a real nice hairline in that poster. And he's got a really nice dark beard. And like, then you like, look, look at him in real I life, and, like, that hairline. That's it. I get, I, I get, you know, the insecurities about, like, is my hairline pushing back a little bit? Mm-hmm. And it's like, probably is because I'm probably, well, you know, that's what happens when you get older. But when you're like, yeah, you look at that movie, it's like... Something seems a bit off about LeBron over here. Yeah, and obviously he's denied that, but it's like you can very easily tell by just looking at pictures of him from the time, like on the red carpet and then the poster that he stood next to. Yeah, like it. it's not hard to do the visual comparison yourself. But he says here that uh, while Michael Jordan does not appear in the film, he is briefly seen on a Space Jam poster. Uh, Michael B. Jordan cameos as himself as a visual gag because they have Bugs Bunny say, I found him, I found Michael Jordan. It's Michael B. Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> Which is pretty funny, but the fact that like, they don't make Michael B. Jordan play basketball is like criminal. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, it's just uh, again, it, it's one of those weird things. Of on paper, they should both be equally bad, but again, like just alone, the fact that you said it's two hours long and like Space Jam is a quick breeze through ninety minutes. We have and that's Bill what Murray. it should be. Other cameos include Bill Murray, who makes a photographic cameo playing golf alongside Bugs Bunny in the credits. Other people in the credits include Travis Scott, you know, the guy who got a people, bunch of people killed at his concert, um, uh, Sandy Hook Denialist, Rowdy Rondy Rousey, and someone I feel really sorry for, Naomi Osaka, tennis player. Because mm. like, you just don't want her to appear next to that list of people, do you? No, not really. Ah. Uh... And then appearances via archive footage include Mike Myers and Seth Green um, uh, in their Austin Powers Dr. Evil. Uh, things like from archive footage, as well as um, uh, Ingrid Bergman um, uh, from Casablanca and Josh Hellman as Slit from Mad Max Fury Road. It says it all, though, doesn't it, when you're like archive footage? Yeah, we couldn't even get him in for a cameo. And that's that's one of the you know scenes that we alluded to earlier, like the big basketball, like, actual scene that you want to watch is, like, oh, okay, it. this is an excuse to put every single Warner Brothers property in the background in the crowd shot for, like, cameos, Mm -hmm. regardless of whether it makes any sense or any context. And, like, yeah. So it reminds me, have you seen, like, the Flash cameo scene? Where it's, like, just... I've I've seen, like, a very quick shot of it. It's two minutes long, and it's just they go into and out of all the different worlds, and it's so bad. Because, like, oh, they have George Reeves' Superman make a cameo. So he doesn't. It's literally just bad CGI George Reeves does the Superman pose, and that's Mm -hmm. it. It's like, well, the the context is you should be having a glimpse into George Reeves' Superman's universe, but that's not a glimpse of his universe. That's promo footage from the thing. And then the closest you get is like, and then you get like Christopher Reeve Superman do the same thing, and then you get the god awful Nick Cage fighting a spider. He looks terrible. It's like fucking hell, but I know. All Remember, the vo- all of it was meant to look bad, Carl. I, I will never get over like the voice of one of the animation directors saying it was meant to look bad on a TikTok where he has 
the speaking into his camera. Also, his phone microphone like this. Mm. It's like, is this a bit? Is this a bit? <laughs> now this guy's like, no, it looked bad on purpose because it's not supposed to be quite right. It's like, just say it looks shit. Yeah, just admit it. Like, it looked, no, it looked bad on oh, I shit my pants on purpose. <laughs> Your Honour. <laughs> then we have voice cast. Um, just Jeff Bergman as Bugs Bunny, Celeste the Cat, Yosemite Sam, all the rest. Fled Flintstone and Yogi Bear because they're in the film for some reason. Eric Bowser mm-hmm. as Daffy Duck, Porky Pig, Foghorn, Leghorn, Elmer Fudd and Marvin the Martian. Zendaya as Lola Bunny. She accepted the offer because of her interest in working with Kugler and being a fan of the original film. Fair enough. And yeah, isn't though like another part of that movie that like people just, you know, took a bridge with was like, on bridge with was like the fact that it's basically never in the Looney Tunes world. Pretty much, yeah. Uh, they even it's have like, a bit It takes where, the yeah. piss out of Looney Tunes yeah, and they, then just calls them shit. They go to Looney Tunes world and it's like, for fucking losers. It's like Looney Tunes loser, Bill. Everyone sucks. Like, go to the real cool world. Like, you know, the Casablanca universe. It's like, really? Who's thought about that film in the last, like, 75 years? It's like, wait a shit on the thing that kept your company afloat for a decade, Warner Bros. And that's the thing is, you know, Space Jam 1 pays reverence to them. Like, literally, they are after the Looney Tunes because they see, like, how entertaining they are. Yeah. And he wants to enslave them because it's, like, obviously Danny DeVito is a bad guy and he's, like, you know, wants to rule over all these these slaves and stuff. And he's, like, well, I'm going to trap you all in my, like, theme park to entertain children forever because you're really good entertainers. <laughs> it's, like, yeah. in this one, it's, like, no, the Looney Tunes are shit. Yeah, uh, just yeah. Some other people in the film, like you got a couple of like m- current basketball players as like the goon squad, but you know, nineties yeah, yeah. era basketball is way more. I'm going to say it's just way more pop culturally accessible to like you know people like myself and Lucas, you know, nerdy white kids from the UK. I knew who the people like, like Charles Barkley was because mm-hmm. of like how just dominant nineties basketball was pop culturally. I don't know any of these people. And we have just other voices, Rosario Dawson as Wonder Woman. Oh, yeah, Justin Roiland talking about people who've like, been accused Ooh. of impropriety. Oh, as Rick Sanchez. Uh, and then we have just... I don't know. Looney Tunes characters who appear in non-speaking roles include Wiley Coyote, um, K-9, Beaky Buzzard, Cecil Turtle, The Three Bears, Witch Hazel, Sam Sheepdog, Roxy and Mugsby, um, Penelope Pussycat, it's just what what is this film? The Nerd Lux, the main antagonist of the original film, appear as sca- spectators during the game via archive footage. So let's now get on to the fun stuff though, Lucas. Warner Bros. cameos and references. Keep in mind this is a Space Jam film about like, you know, Bugs Bunny. And it's for kids. Or it's meant to be. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's meant, meant to, be to be for kids. So as the Warner Bros. serververse features prominently in the film, it incorporates numerous cameos and appearances and references to other Warner Bros. proprieties or properties depicted as planets. So I'm going to go through all these, Lucas, and you just tell me if it's for kids or not, or if it would be suitable for the young kids who are clearly intended to be the audience for this thing. Mm-hmm. So first of all, Game of Thrones. No, definitely Mad Ma- not. Mad Max. No. The Matrix. I mean, you could argue, but no, not really. They, the people get blown down with bullets many, many a time in that movie. Casablanca, which is suitable for kids, but what kid's going to watch Casablanca? Or even yeah, know what it like, is? It's not, that's not its target audience, for sure. The Wizard of Oz. The first of one course, that's yeah. actually, yeah, The Wizard of Oz. Yeah. Classic yeah. film. One of the, like, the greatest films ever made. King Kong! No, he's not maybe, that scary. Yeah. but yeah. still like, you know, a bit, maybe a bit scary, a bit violent. The Iron Giant, so that's actually a course, pretty yeah. good pick. Uh, Rick and Morty. Movie. New Austin Powers. New. A lot of sex references in that Austin Powers universe. Mortal Kombat. Oh yeah, that's lovely for kids. I love those fatalities. I mean, that's the thing. I say that knowing I played Mortal Kombat a lot as a kid. Yeah, but it's nice. You wouldn't. Ex- it's you it's wouldn't... not intended for children. Though. Yeah. Um, it. I hope children are not watching that. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Which okay, yes. Of course, yeah, yeah. Beetlejuice. Yes, yeah. like there's some weird it's things like in there, but yeah. It's horror comedy, isn't it? It's Dun- on the edge. Dunkirk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dunkirk! <laughs> Fucking Dunkirk in World space. War II in the... Gremlins. Gre- bring Gremlins yes. back. 
Mm-hmm. The, uh, speaking of bringing back the Animaniacs. Oh, yes. God, the Animaniacs were so good. Steven Spielberg's best work. A Clockwork Orange. Yeah. Yeah, kids definitely watch that one. And then Harry Potter and the Goonies. So the yeah. majority of the things it references are not suitable for kids. Because due In to- a movie where like the you know intended audience is kids and then therefore you are promoting all of these things in the crowd to those kids mm-hmm. so that's what the cameos are there for essentially yeah. is to market those other properties via space jam and it's a kids movie yeah and it's usually as well like cameos and stuff it's the things that you go oh wow it's that character like, who the fuck's going look it's Ingrid Bergman from Casablanca getting like <laughs> the thing is I'd only accept these cameos if every cameo was them getting dunked on by Bugs Bunny if LeBron yeah. James is like no I want to dunk on the guy from Casablanca and King Kong like, like, have you ever seen it, that like um, uh, if it was King Kong versus Iron Giant in a basketball one on one yeah I'd watch that yeah so have you ever seen that amazing image someone did that shit post someone did of like Oh, yeah, just as a laugh, I decided to draw um, uh, Venom dunking on Spider-Man in basketball. Like, look at this. <laughs> look at the image I just sent you. That's so good. Yeah, that's, that's so rad. It's like, people are like, I want that. Yeah. Well, uh, let's just, to end on though, let's go to critical response. So what, what would be your review of Space Jam A New Legacy, Lucas? I mean, I, I have not actually watched it, so I can't give an honest review, but like, you yeah, know, you can. I would, I would assume the if it was you know 90 minutes long maybe a 6 out of 10 but being 2 hours like a 4 well you've got it bang on the money there Lucas review aggregator Rotten Tomatoes the film holds a approval rating of 25% so approval rating it often gets conflated with like rating approval rating Mm -hmm. just means 25% of reviewers would recommend you watch it whereas 75% do not but as a weighted average rating of 4.4 out of 10 so you will bang on the money with that one I'd say, take half an hour out of that movie, you might make it a 6 out of 10, but... Yep. Oh, it's a long run time. Uh, Metacritic give it 36 out of 100, based on 46 critics rating. So again, close. Like close to 4 out of 10. I'll uh, take it. According to Screen Rant writer Jordan Williams, the majority of critical reviews target the films, and I quote, lack of fun, humour, and earnest lightheartedness, overt promotion of Warner Bros. property, disappointment with celebrity in NBA roles, and the two-hour runtime pretty like you know just incisive uh, comments there we have the uh, the av clubs aa dow gave it a c minus stating that the film's comprehensiveness did nothing although it gave uh, made misdirections um, which it was subject to glittering cgi trash heap of cameos mm-hmm. oh and stale internet catchphrases don't forget they reference big oh, chungus in yeah. this they reference big chungus lucas yeah and that was what like as you say it got like a solid seven years of production. Yeah. And that's probably, like, the Big Chungus thing was written in, in, like, 2014. Yeah. The thing, then, yeah. Admittedly, Big Chungus is very, very funny, but in the mm-hmm. film, it's like that thing, isn't it? Of, it's like, the moment the company references it, you can't, it's not cool anymore. But, like, the only one I, review I care about is someone on Twitter who said, and I quote, um, I watched the new Space Jam today, and in the movie, Bugs turned into Big Chungus, and a kid in the theatre lost his shit so hard, um, his mother had to take him outside. I forgot the entire <laughs> film on the drive home. <laughs> and that is I'm, at Yosh X on uh, Twitter. I just wanted to point out as well, I just got up Space Jam, the original on Wikipedia as well. Mm-hmm. So I just want to like read this one paragraph of critical okay. response. Just to, you know, to give a fair comparison. Yeah, because I mean, we um, say it's probably it's a six or seven out of ten that's carried by nostalgia, but it did have an album that went platinum. I believe I Can mm, Fly did go platinum. Um. So yeah, critical response for Space Jam from 1996. Um. On review aggregator Rotten Tomatoes, Space Jam holds an approval rating of 43% based on 86 reviews, with an average rating of 5.3 out of 10. Um. The website's critic consensus reads, while it's no slam dunk, Space Jam's silly, Looney Tunes-laden slapstick and vivid animation will leave younger viewers satisfied, Mm -hmm. though accompanying adults may be more annoyed than entertained. Metacritic assigned the film a weighted average score of 59 out of 100 based on 22 critics, indicating mixed or average reviews. 
audiences polled by cinema score gave the film an average grade of an A minus on an A plus to F scale. So yeah, you know, a fun, light-hearted kids film that's a solid, you know, five, six out of ten. Yeah. So now speaking of the original film, Joe Pitka, the director of the original Space Jam, expressed hatred towards the new film upon its release. Among his complaints, Pitka compared LeBron James to Michael Jordan, who was arguably the most famous celebrity in the world when the film was released, in comparison to James. He criticised the story for not tying up emotionally to LeBron's life, felt the first film's cast and soundtrack was superior um, to a new legacy, and saw Bugs Bunny's role in the film as heartbreaking. Because he doesn't do anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It feels like the Looney Tunes really got pushed aside. Yeah, and then we have um, just one final amazing dunk from Hwang dong Hyuk, the creator of Korean television series Squid Game. <laughs> because James criticised the final moments in each episode. Oh, uh, okay. Um, specifically, like, the final moments of the, you know, the conclusions of the final season. Mm-hmm. And uh, he... <laughs> He responded, have you seen Space Jam 2? LeBron James is cool when he can say what he wants. I respect that. I'm very thankful he watched the whole series, but I wouldn't change my ending. That's my ending. If he has his own ending that will satisfy him, maybe he could make his own sequel. I'll check it out and maybe send him a message saying, I liked your whole show, except the ending. <laughs> but that got boiled down too when like LeBron James on Twitter like, that Squid Game show, that ending sucks. He just tweeted back, like, have you seen, have you seen Space Jam 2? <laughs> and it's just... What more do you need to say? Um, Have you seen Space Jam 2? That is a good point because LeBron James is a big superstar in the NBA world, but mm-hmm. isn't he's not a celebrity, the biggest no. celebrity in the world like Michael Jordan might have been at the time. It's it's how he's and, described here, yeah. He was Michael Jordan was a transcendental figure. Where he was like mm-hmm. he was famous just worldwide. And we'll never see anything like it. Playing. Again. Um and that's the thing, who would you class now as like the world's biggest celebrity right now? Biggest celebrity athlete, it's probably The Rock. Just no, 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 just biggest celebrity in the world. Okay, so biggest celebrity in the world, like the most famous person on earth. So I'm thinking right now, maybe Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift, yeah. Um, that's a good answer. I always try to think of like a celebrity or a movie star, but maybe the, someone from Marvel. But you know, yeah, for a bit, the, it would have been, like, been Robert Downey Jr. Maybe for a bit. Maybe for a bit, yeah. Not um, so much anymore. So we don't really have like mega blockbusters yeah. anymore that are like actor led, do we? No, but I like I I'd be down to watch like Taylor Swift somehow like lose her voice and Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck have to like rescue the performance. Well they do say that um a proposed sequel is in the works with Dwayne Johnson and it's gonna be a wrestling centered oh. one. But like if you think athlete turned celebrity, it probably would be the rock. I prefer for yeah. it to be John Cena. It's going to be the, the thing, Rock, though. The when we're cheaper. talking about ego getting in the way of things, it's like, oh, no. Because, like, The Rock, are they, are they going to be able to have fun and poke fun at The Rock? Or is it going to be, no, I have to be perfect at all times? Like, don't forget, Lucas. Like They're making a live-action version of Moana because The Rock wants to play whatever, what was his character in that? Uh, Maui. He wants to play Maui because, you know, his ego would not let someone else play that role. Mm-hmm. So they're like farting out a live action version of that film less than 10 years after it's released. Yeah, like seven years later or whatever. Just so he can play Maui. They're doing The Last of Us Part 1, Carl. Hell yeah. Let's go. Well, that was, yeah, Space Jam, A New Legacy. All of a sudden, A New Legacy. And it's like you go down <laughs> to the section titled Reception and Legacy. It's like, it's wank, it's wank, it's wank. Everyone thought it sucked. It does, all it does is make the, pre- the precursor better by comparison. Yeah. The new legacy is a non-existent legacy. Yeah. So imagine having the balls to call it a new legacy and just like, it doesn't even manage to break, get, get back its budget. I find it so funny when you look at things like that in hindsight, where it's like, oh, they banked everything on like this one thing kicking off and it just died on its ass. It's, it's like so a, good. Point to the like the mummy with the yeah. dark universe and they do they like already tripled down on the dark universe. And it's like, nope, nope, the mummy bombed. Go. Just the destroy Bruce it. Pointing to the stands, like, I'm going to hit a home run. I'm going to hit a home and run. You watch, the, watch, home watch, run. watch me hit this home run. And it's not even that they don't hit the home run, it's that they completely fucking spoon it and fall over and somehow <laughs> break the leg. <laughs> like, they just went for a wild foul ball. They did. But yeah. So, I guess, folks at home, let us know which wiki you thought won this week. 
Remember, it's, you're not voting for the quality, whether you like the thing more. It's whether or not the wiki was more interesting. Because that's the thing, people like, they vote for the thing that they like. It's like, no, vote for the thing that you think was most interesting. What, what did you learn the most from? Like, which one brought the most interesting discussion or, like, you know, brought you the most facts or whatever, however yeah. you want to judge it? Don't just vote for the thing. It's like when you watch, like, Death Battle and people are like, well, I hope, I wish this character won because they're my favourite. It's like, that's not what it's asking you. It's not which character's the most popular, otherwise fucking Link and Sephiroth would win everything. It's like, yeah, but Carl, Goku. Yeah. Goku. I like Goku. Why didn't Goku beat Superman? Yeah. It's like, because they broke down exactly why for but, half no, an but, hour. But Goku should win, though, because Goku, I like Goku. Goku, 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 Goku. Yeah. I can't no. wait for part three after, like, oh, Ultra Instinct Goku, though. So, yeah. That's the thing, so I sort of clarify that for people. Like, you're not voting for your favourite, you're voting for... Like, but, but people can never get past that. It's like, what? Well, mm-hmm. I like this thing. So, I get it. Yeah, That's why I don't like Space Jam. And, uh, thank you. For, for keeping with us through Space Jam A New Legacy. Yeah. Just think this podcast was twice as long. That'd be almost as long as Space Jam A New Legacy. <laughs> think about that. 